So we put out an SOS yesterday to Gilstrap because we have uh, a New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap, on the program. <laughs> we have been exposed to uh, several uh, accomplished authors that have added very interesting segments to this program. And Mr. Gilstrap, I ask you to take the reins and introduce our next. Well, our, our next guest is Denise Kiernan, who is an author, journalist, producer, and host of Craft Authors in Conversation. Her new uh, young reader's book, We Gather Together, Stories of Thanksgiving from Then to Now, arrives in September of 2023. And I believe she's coming back to talk about this in studio uh, in, in, in a few weeks, a few months. Uh, and it's a companion title to the popular adult nonfiction book, We Gather Together, and a children's picture book, Giving Thanks. Uh, her book, The Last Castle, was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and paperback and was also a Wall Street Journal bestseller. She is also the author of The Girls of Atomic City, which is a New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and NPR bestseller and has been published in multiple languages. She lives in North Carolina, but she is with us via telephone. Good morning, Denise. Good morning. Denise, I think we're going to have to have a lengthier name on the program. Mr. Gilstrap on the show is known as New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. You will now be known as instant New York Times bestselling author Denise Kiernan. <laughs> and I think for the remainder of the conversation, we should be forced to address each other exactly that. <laughs> and, and let's be honest, it's instant New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Oh, he's been better. Author Denise Kiernan. <laughs> she's, she's trouncing you, my man. <laughs> You ought to see the business card. It's, it's <laughs> continued on the next business pages. card. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, Denise, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. No, thanks so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, we've we've done several interviews uh, in regards to Rosie the Riveter and the women who worked behind the scenes, oftentimes uh, to help win World War II. How does your book differ from the Rosie the Riveter story? In what I consider to be one of the most uh, fascinating ways when you think about how people felt about supporting World War II and doing their part um, at the time, the women that I wrote about were working on the Manhattan Project, the government's top secret government project that resulted in the world's first nuclear weapons and um, nuclear energy. But the catch was they didn't know that's what they were working on. So, and, and, and this was in Oak Ridge, right? This was in Tennessee. This was not out in Los Alamos. Right, exactly. And that's a, that's a good point, too, that um, sometimes a lot of people don't realize because we have been told the story of the Manhattan Project so often from this top-down perspective, from the perspective of the generals and the Nobel Prize winners and all of these great, wonderful brains out in the desert in Los Alamos, where actually there were three main sites uh, Hanford in Washington, Los Alamos, of course, and Oak Ridge in Tennessee. And Oak Ridge was actually the administrative headquarters for the Manhattan Project um, and was was massive compared to a place like Los Alamos. And, it, you know, this was a town that didn't exist. This was a, a town. It was custom built for this purpose. Um, and went from, you know, not not existing in late 1942 to having a population of near 80,000 by mid, you know, 1945 and using more electricity than New York City. And it's not on a map. So this is this is where the majority of my book, The Girls of Atomic City, takes place. And to go back to your original question, how is this different from something like Rosie the Riveter? Well, when you there was a certain amount of uh, pride when I, I interviewed all these people, which is how I did the book, and we can get to that later. But there was a certain amount of pride, like I'm building, you know, I am riveting airplanes, or I am, you know, I used to work at this factory, but now I am helping assemble, you know, munitions or tanks or this, that, and the other thing. These women felt very strongly about doing their part for the war, but. They had no idea how their little piece of the puzzle fit into the much larger plan for Oak Ridge, which was to provide uh, fuel for the first atomic bomb. Well, I, there, there are so many elements of the Manhattan Project and about all these these overnight cities that popped up. I, I love the whole concept of getting a notice that your your property your farm and this is how it happened i believe your farm has been condemned you need to be off of it in two weeks 
without yes the government mm -hmm. the government used eminent domain to seize between 56 and 58,000 acres um, in eastern Tennessee so yes some people had as little as two weeks notice and you know basically would hear hear from someone in town or have a knock at the door or something tacked up to a tree in a yard one person said that said you know you got to get out of here uh, the government is taking this land it's you know our right to do so and you know, good luck. And so it was this mad dash to, uh, you know, not only just pack up a house, but, you know, a lot of these folks were subsistence farmers, you know, reap what you could because that's what you ate and uh, find a new place to live. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of these people, I mean, there were generations who who lived on this land. And, um, you know, ironically, some of the people who were kicked off that land for the Manhattan Project would actually end up working on that land, but in a factory for the Manhattan Project. The book we're talking about is The Girls of Atomic City by Denise Kiernan. The, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the mission of Oak Ridge was the development of the fuel, right? The isotopes that would then... It, enriching uranium, exactly. And, How can you and, not know well, what you're doing? <laughs> well, this is no, I mean, that that is when I first started becoming aware of this story, uh, I was just fascinated to talk to people about how they could go to work every day and, and not know what they were doing. And it was a very and depending on what area you worked in, you might know more than somebody else. So General Groves, who is, you know, the overall head of the Manhattan Project um, out of the Army Corps of Engineers, mm. Leslie he, Groves. Leslie Groves, yes. um, a man who gave us also the, oversaw the building of the Pentagon. He was very adamant about only telling the whole key to security was only telling people what they needed to know to do their job well. That was it. Stick to your knitting, he would say. So, you know, you mind your own business. You over here, you mind your business. So the entire facility was designed, first of all, to keep people separate. So everybody had ID badges. You would have badges that dictated which buildings you could go in, in some cases, which floors you were allowed to access, which cafeterias you were allowed to eat in. If you had a, you know, a badge that said, I work in Y-12, you could not even get on a bus that was going to K the factory K-25. So there were at every turn, there were ways that they sort of corralled people and kept them in their individual specific domain, work domain, and living domain. Um, on top of that, you really were just given a tiny amount of information ab about what you were doing. So, for example, you, would, you had mentioned, you know, Oak Ridge was uh, responsible for providing fuel. And one of the enrichment processes, enriching uranium, was electromagnetic separation. And... Uh, a lot of very, very young women operated what were called at the time calutrons, okay? These, but their job, all they knew was sit on, this, sit on this stool and look at these dials, these massive machines with knobs and all, all sorts of stuff. Just look at this needle right here. If that needle starts going to the left, turn your knob to the right. Try and keep that needle in the middle. If that needle starts going to the right, Turn this knob to the left. And if it sparks, call a supervisor. That was basically <laughs> their training. And one of my one of my women who worked there actually met her husband because he was a supervisor. Um, <laughs> but um, so that's what they knew. They didn't know that they were, you know, helping to, you know, control this massive, massive, you know, output, uh, not output, this massive uh, operation that would help create actually very tiny amounts of enriched uranium that would then be shipped off to Los Alamos. So that's all they knew. So they were actually operating extremely, uh, you know, equipment that had only been on the planet for maybe a year or two at that point. But they didn't know. All they knew is they needed to to turn their knobs. You Would know, you I had another I had another woman who, um, you know, worked checking pipes for leaks. You know, and she, all she did all day was, you know, the pipes would be lowered down in front of her and 
they would, you know, run probes over them that were actually mass spectrometers, but she didn't know that. It's just like, run the probe, and if you hear a beep, put an X, that's a bad pipe. Okay. So all day, she's pipes coming in, pipes going out. She has no idea those are the pipes that are going to be a part of a gaseous diffusion process for, again, enriching uranium. Um, you know, she, all she knew was pipes. So it, it, that's, that's part of how they kept all of this um, secret. And, you know, the other, the other way was you were not, you could not ask questions about anything beyond what you needed to do your job. And you certainly shouldn't ask anybody else what they were working on. D Denise, um, this, yeah, uh, this, yeah. Is, this is the other John, John Doyle. Uh, is know. that part of the reason that they had, they kept those locations so separate from each other, uh, Hanford, uh, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge? Part of, well, Los Alamos, um, they definitely wanted to be very, very, very far away and secluded. And actually that area that they ended up um Oppenheimer had a had a history with that that part of the state. Um, Oak Ridge was chosen um, because it was for a variety of reasons, but it was close enough to D.C. and New York to get back and forth for the big wigs who needed to to come in. Um, it was you know in the you know somewhat in the mountains, so it was kind of secluded and away from the coast because after Pearl Harbor, nobody wanted to have anything important on the coast. Um, the ridges and everything in Oak Ridge made it quite easy for them to keep the, um, the plants, the plants enriching uranium separate from the, the living area to at least a certain extent in case something went wrong. Um, but also, very importantly, the Tennessee Valley Authority recently had, had – there was a massive hydroelectric power, and they needed – uh, they needed Got a lot it. of power. And they did want to spread things. They didn't want everything all in one place because that's that's not what you do when you're in a you know, in an armed conflict. You want to spread out spread out what you have. So there were a variety of reasons these, these different sites were chosen. Okay. I, I marvel at the enormity of the secret and the ability to keep it secret. I I'm trying to imagine this happening today and maybe it is happening today and we don't know about it but um that's what i always say that's what i always say i was i was giving i'm sorry to i was giving a talk once and they said you could never do that today and i said well maybe not i don't know i and i said well i mean you know what's going on at what used to be you know fort dix right and they said no i said oh yeah you haven't heard about it? no i said well I haven't either because I don't think there is anything going on. But how would you know? I, have you ever tried? Have you ever tried to get on a military base? Hey, <laughs> I, know, Denise, I had basic training at Fort Dix. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, not, Jack, not Jackson. Okay, yeah. So I, I actually I threw it was Fort Dix I threw out there, and I said, you know, you try and get on a military base and ask questions. Tell me how it goes. Now, certainly the the and it wasn't. I mean. It was secret. What they were doing was secret, but something that big, I mean, it wasn't invisible. So, I mean, the, the surrounding areas, they knew something very big was going on over there. They just didn't know exactly what it was. Um, and whenever there were, and there were, you know, it was not a perfect system, but when, you know, people got too nosy, they got fired and they lost their job and they lost their housing and you just never saw them again. Denise, where did the women of Atomic City come from? Were they recruited? Were they people who responded to ads in a newspaper? It was a re recruitment, not just for the women, but for the men and for all levels of employment was a huge undertaking and quite challenging as well. Going back to what we were saying about Rosie the Riveter, there was always ads in the newspaper, you know, support your country, build, you know, build this kind of bomber and blah, blah, blah. Well, all they could say when they were advertising for anything having to do with Oak Ridge was plumbers needed war effort, you know, something like that very vague. Um, and some of these women, uh, some of these women heard through family and friends. Some of them came as, you know, came from further away, especially ones who had scientific knowledge or teaching experience. They needed people to train. Um, and some were recruited right out of the halls of their high school. And, you know, the people would come, the scouts, you know, would come in there. I had one woman was, I talked to was recruited out of her high school. Another one was recruited uh, out of her job. She was working at a, basically at like a luncheonette. And she was approached after she left work one day. This guy had been coming into the, 
into this uh, restaurant quite often and, you know, recognized her as, you know, capable, smart, did her job, always on time, all the, all these sorts of things. And so he just, you know, walked up to her, took her, took her aside. She was telling me this, you know, well, he asked me to like walk down this alley so people couldn't hear us. And I'm like, can you go? <laughs> what are you thinking? You know? <laughs> and he said, he basically said, you know, do you want to come to Eastern Tennessee and make 78 cents an hour, which at the time was, she couldn't believe it. And she said, when do I leave? He said, you can be on a bus tomorrow. That's a great, and that's all she that's all she knew. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds like a great uh, pickup line there. I'm gonna have to try that uh, <laughs> next time I find myself I mean, single. Yeah. No, I mean all the things I all the things I uh, they would tell me. I'd think to myself, "Wow, I would I would have a lot of red flags." So <laughs> I, I live these conversations. I live relatively close to Fort Detrick, which is where okay. they test a lot of the scary things. scary things that are out there and uh the now defunct fort ritchie which is where the code breakers were uh during oh, right. during world war ii so mm -hmm. were they looking for particular skills with these women or was it just simply as easy as someone who's relatively healthy and can move to where we would need them to move to uh it's a, yes so women there were a couple women that i interviewed who actually worked in labs so they obviously would have had or worked in statistical areas so they obviously would have had a very certain kind of uh, skill set. There were women in all kinds of jobs. There were bus drivers. There were, you know, women's air corps people assigned there. There were, they needed, you know, it was a place that people lived too. So they needed people to, you know, work in the butcher shop. They needed people to, you know, all sorts of things. Um, for the women who were working in some of these enrich enrichment facilities, all they wanted was, or what they wanted most of all, were people who would basically do what they were told without asking a lot of questions. So you had to have a certain amount of, you had to be very capable and able to follow directions, which when you're recruiting 17 year old, you know, young women can might, might be challenging. You don't know who, you know, they haven't even left home yet. So like being out on their own and taking on these responsibilities, you know, they needed, they needed, you know, confident, smart, you know, folks who would do what they were told, learn quickly and that was it. And then just go about their business. You know, they and they would ask in the communities, they would check people out. Was she, you know, was she wild? Did she drink? Um, was she ever in trouble at school? And, you know, Dot, the woman I interviewed who was recruited out of her high school, I mean, the recruiters had already talked to the teachers in these schools asking, you know, you know, good eggs versus bad eggs, you know, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. So it was you didn't have to necessarily have a particular educational background, but how you conducted yourself was something they were they were definitely concerned about. Did Oak Ridge turnover was a problem? You know, this has to be a quick one. We have about forty seconds left. Right. Did Oak Ridge yep. grow to be its own self-contained city the way Los Alamos did? Yeah, it is. It's still there. Uh, actually, the Oak Ridge National Lab is uh, one of the biggest and uh, most successful national labs in the country and our supply of enriched uranium is there denise kiernan thanks so much where can we find the girls of atomic city anywhere books are sold um no seriously you can um <laughs> it's it's in bookstores i always suggest buying from an independent bookstore but you know it's Amen. on amazon and barnes and noble and all that sort of stuff and if you want more information you can go to my website, which is denisekiernan.com. But, yeah, you can find it pretty much anywhere. Denise Kiernan, instant New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. <laughs> that trumps New York Times bestselling author I've John Gilstrap. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. You were a lot of fun. This sounds like a great book. Thank you. Take care.